Hey friends, I'm back today. I wanted to talk a little bit about disappointment, especially in light of, I really have on my mind, like the seniors who don't get to graduate or have their proms. I have on my mind uh, friends who've had to cancel their wedding that they've been planning, you know, dreaming about their whole life, and thinking about uh, any sense of normalcy, you know, that a lot of us are grieving. And I read an article this morning about how a lot of what we're feeling really is grief. Uh, and, and grief is just another word for disappointment. And how grief that we're feeling really is just kind of, not necessarily our imagination, but in some ways it is because we're imagining our future and what could be. And this time we actually have a culprit, which is the virus, <laughs> where sometimes we can imagine, you know, awful things happening and they seem far-fetched, but now, uh, this looks a little bit more, uh, well, it's, it's more close up and it's scary. And so there's a grief in some way in our imagination of what's coming or what could be. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about disappointment by using the word grief today. And, you know, the thing about grief, I don't know about you guys, but I was taught that grief uh, was linear. You know, when you think about uh, the, those stages of grief of of denial and acceptance and uh, and those types of things, bartering, that th they go in order. And that's really not true. That grief is really messy and it's on a spectrum. So, you know, pain is pain. So we don't want to compare our pain, right? Because pain is pain. However, when I think about my disappointment or my grief of having a trip canceled, it doesn't have the same impact on my soul as, say, my friend who had to cancel her wedding. So mine might be mild. So if you think of grief or disappointment um, on a spectrum, mine is a little bit more mild, and hers definitely has more of an impact on her soul. Again, not saying to compare grief, but the reality is grief, uh, um, excuse me, grief looks more like this. It's a grief. It's just a ball. It's just a ball of mixed emotions that it's never really clear. And you could be five things in one day. You could feel all these different things. And you can actually, you can Google this as well, grief ball. I, I did and I found it. Um, so you, if you want this. But this accurately, you know, portrays, I believe, what's going on in us more so than just that linear thinking. So if you're one who thinks linear, about uh, linear, is that a word, linearly? If you think that way about grief, just try to remove that from your mind because it's not, it's messy and it's not neat. And reality is disappointment is an invitation to trust in the mysteries of God. And it's, I, this is actually one of my favorite books. It sounds terrible. It's like a terrible name of a book, but it's Shattered Dreams, one of my favorite books by uh, my best friend, Larry Crabb. <laughs> so, I uh, want to read a little bit of what, he's, what he has to say about grief. So hang with me. Here's a couple of pages. I'm tired of doing great. These were the words of a man who had recently suffered an enormous loss. His friends were concerned and supportive. They sent him books on handle, handling grief. They spent time with him in prayer and on the golf course, and several sent lit letters expressing their love. A few included verses from the Bible they said had been impressed on them by the Lord. When his friends called or came to visit, the first question after a quick greeting was always, How are you? He hated the question the first time he heard it, and he hated it more each time. He knew the right answer, the one his friends were hoping to hear, the one that had more to do with relieving their concern than with expressing his own heart. The hoped-for answer could be expressed in many ways, but its message was always the same. It's hard, but I'm okay, or at least I'm getting there. To the last person he asked, he put the message in these words. Well, it's still really hard. I miss her so much. Sometimes I worry how I'll manage, but I'm not breaking down as often now, and I'm going out more and getting back to all I need to be doing. Guess I'm moving in the right direction. Thanks for asking. His words had their intended effect. The questioner smiled with relief and said, I'm really glad. Not surprised, though. Lots of us have been praying. 
Larry makes a note. He said he notices three different things in this exchange. He said, number one, the man's friend assumed that prayer has more to do with getting someone to feel better than with pleading for movement along the path into God's presence. So let me say that again. The man's friend assumed that prayer has more to do with getting someone to feel better than with pleading for movement along the path into God's presence. So what is our motivation when we see our, our friends hurting? Is it to get them to feel better? Is it to um, take away their pain or alleviate it? Or do we sense something deeper going on below the surface that we can't really explain? But we're trusting that you want to be present to whatever God is doing more than just wanting to alleviate their pain or to try and make them feel better. Uh, the second thing is that he further assumed that if the spirit were doing his work, the suffering man would indeed feel better. Doing great on the path of God means feeling great, or at least feeling better. That's what most of us think. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes we have to go deeper into the loss and the grief, and naming it just takes a while. It could take years. For some, it's, it's different for every person. And so, but... I love that. Let me read it again. He further assumed that if the Spirit were doing His work, the suffering man would indeed feel better. Doing great on the path to God means feeling great, or at least feeling better. That's what most of us think. So wrestle with that a little bit. The third thing is he distanced himself from the sorrowing man's soul. Without consciously intending to, he let the man know that he did not want to be with him in pain. He wanted rather to be with him only as an agent of improvement. So as a struggling man listened to his friend, he felt a tidal wave of intense loneliness sweep over him. He returned the smile, but his soul shriveled behind a familiar wall that left him lifeless, more desperate and alone than before. We spoke a few hours later, and he recounted the conversation, described his reaction to it, and that's when he said, I'm tired of doing great. Just yesterday, I overheard two of my friends talking about me. One asked how I was doing. The other said I was doing great, and I wanted to scream. When life kicks us in the stomach, we want someone to be with us as we are, not as he or she wishes us to be. We don't want someone trying to make us feel better. That effort, no matter how well intended, creates a pressure that adds to our distress. Why is it so difficult to simply give ourselves to each other when things are hard without yielding to the urge to give relief, to help, to try to make things better? Oh, that is so, it kicks me in the gut what I want to do. I want to take pain away. I want to make things better. And uh, people just have to go through the grieving process to name the disappointment. One thing that Henry Nowen said in his devotional, Turn My Morning Into Dancing, he said, hope is willing to leave unanswered questions unanswered and unknown futures unknown. Hope makes you see what God's guiding hand, not only in the gentle and pleasant moments, but also in the shadows of disappointment and darkness. Sorry, let me read that again. Hope is willing to leave unanswered questions unanswered and unknown futures unknown. Hope makes you see God's guiding hand, not only in the gentle and pleasant moments, but also in the shadows of disappointment and darkness. So we don't have to try and explain uh, or make up a narrative to try and make someone feel better. I mean, when you're watching your child grieve and we're not getting to graduate or not getting to go to prom, there's not a great narrative, and there's not a look on the bright side. Just let them walk through it. So, as Larry says, grief cannot be managed, only embraced. Grief cannot be managed, only embraced. And we don't like that feeling of not being able to manage things in our life. But, I mean, grief and disappointment is to be embraced. And so what do we need? We need one. The ability to embrace our own humanity. And I think sometimes as Christians, we feel like we have to act a certain way and it might not be congruent with what's really going on. It's like, just embrace. We are human. You are a human who is going to grieve and who's not going to get it right every time. Embrace your limitations. Embrace that it might take you a while to get to the place that you want to be or where God wants to take you. Sometimes that's a really slow journey. And as Larry always says, change is slow. Growth is slow. Real change. Real growth. And I've seen that time and again. That the majority of time growth is slow. It follows the seasons. There's the seasons of, of death, burial, resurrection, and the waiting in the tomb. 
So one, embrace our humanity. Second, if you can name the loss, it's so important to name it. You can help your kids name what they're they're sad about or what, you know, they're sad from the little things. They, they're sad about missing field day or their school play or, again, prom. Or they're sad about having all the people they love that they dreamed about gathering for a wedding. They're sad about it. So if they can name it. Some people will want to do that completely alone. It's so personal. And write it down or shout it out. And some will want to gather a group of friends when they're able to, when we're able to gather again and just talk about it. That's really healing just to get it out there and to actually name what they've lost. And then we need time. We need time. Uh, time is your friend. My a mentor of mine, Debbie, would always say that to me when I was going through uh, just an intense season of grief. She's like, time is your friend. I'm like, it is not. Time feels brutal. Time feels like the enemy. But she was right. Time is our friend. And the last thing is we need presence. We need presence. In 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7, let me read this to you. This is Paul talking. And he says, For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within. I love that he acknowledges that he had fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. So he, just even the, the verbal word from another friend of a group of people's presence was healing and helpful and deeply encouraging to Paul. So we need presence. And we need the presence of God and we need the presence of others. Um, so, uh, goodness, it's probably been almost 10 years now. I was in a really, really difficult uh, season of, of grief, grieving, I mean, really singleness and wondering if I would ever be a mom and all those things. And I show up to Larry Crabb's school of spiritual direction and, or no, it was, it was, um, his other school called next step for people who've already gone through his school of spiritual direction and just kind of want to go a little bit deeper. And so during that time, he would pick somebody from the class, there's a class of 30 and he would counsel that person in front of the group for the whole week. And I'm like, <laughs> So I was that person for that week to where he sat with me uh, for hours um, that week in front of the group. And I didn't care. I was in such a desperate place. I didn't care who was hearing or listening. And and I was sharing all the things that I was grieved about. And you know, by the end of that time, none of those things had changed. Not one thing had changed. I didn't get any answers. I didn't. I mean, but what I did get was presence. So I walked away from that time, not thinking about Larry, even though Larry is so dear to me. I walked away from that time just loving Jesus more and having hope in the middle of where I was, even though there were no answers or no explanations. But it was the power of presence. And that right now is what we can offer to each other, even if it's through a letter like Paul received a letter. And uh, in word from Titus, it doesn't have to be a huge, massive group of people. But we need the presence of God and we need the presence of others. So a couple of things, or more than a couple of things, some resources for people who are walking through disappointment. Again, I mentioned Shattered Dreams by Larry Crabb. It's a tough read. I mean, when I first read it, I think I was 26 years old and I threw it across the room a few times. It's it's a tough read um, just because it really, I don't know, really messed a lot with some of my entitlement that came out. Uh, the Grief Ball. Like I said, the grief ball. I know one friend who actually got a volleyball and wrote some of these words on the volleyball. Some music, my favorite right now. Well, it's been my favorite for a while, but uh, for when I need a bigger perspective is Andrew Peterson. And his album, specifically The Burning Edge of Dawn, is my favorite. So I'm going to close. Once again, if you've been with me the past couple of days, you've seen me read from Every Moment Holy, this book of liturgies. And I actually purchased, uh, today I purchased the rights to, to give uh, this lit liturgy. It's called Liturgy for the Death of a Dream. And I purchased the rights to 
to be able to use this with 100 people. And so if you would like a copy of this, I'm just going to read just a short part of it. It's long. Um, again, just reach out to me with my email at beth at withincorporated.org. Beth at withincorporated.org. And let me know you'd like the liturgy. And so the first 100 people uh, to request that, I will get that to you. So let me close with this. Liturgy for the death of a dream. O Christ, in whom the final fulfillment of all hope is held secure, I bring to you now the weathered fragments of my former dreams, the broken pieces of my expectations, the rent patches of hopes worn thin, and the shards of some shattered image of life as I once thought it would be. What I so wanted has not come to pass. And in my head, I know that you are sovereign even over this, over my tears, my confusion, and my disappointment. But I still feel at this moment as if I've been abandoned, as if you do not care that these hopes have collapsed to rubble. And yet I know this is not so. You are the sovereign of my sorrow. You apprehend a wider sweep with wiser eyes than mine. My history bears the fingerprints of grace. You were always faithful, though I could not always trace quick evidence of your presence in my pain. Yet did you remain at work, lurking in the weeds, sifting all my splinterings for bright embers that might be breathed into more eternal dreams. So let me remain tender now to how you would teach me. Let this point disappointment do its work. Let me listen to its holy whisper. Let me be tutored by this new disappointment, that I might release at last these lesser dreams, that I might embrace the better dreams you dream for me and for your people and for your kingdom and for your creation. Let me join myself to these, investing all hope in the one hope that will never come undone. Betray those who place their trust in it. Teach me to hope, O Lord, always and only in you. You are the king of my collapse. You answer not what I demand, but what I do not even know to ask. Now take this dream, this husk, this chaff of my desire, and give it back reformed and remade according to your better vision. Do not give it back at all. Have a good day, you guys.